Okay, welcome back to the colonial economy. The riches of the 13 co English colonies poured into England. Fat bundles of tobacco, bulging bags of rice, soft furs, and crates of deep blue indigo dye rolled off the ships, all for England's profit. So the United States, or the then colonies, didn't really get the profit off of it. England did, okay? The big picture is more people arrived in the English colonies, their economy grew. Economy is how they make their money. Some of the products the colonies produced appear in the infograph, infographic on page 232. So here's the infographic on page 232. Let me bop it up for a little bit. So Maine and Massachusetts looks like they had what? So if you look down here, wood products. So the tree means wood products, the fish means fish. Ships means ships, that means grain. Tobacco is the leaf, indigo is the blue box, and rice is a bag of rice. Uh, remember I said indigo is a, a dye? So indigo is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and then it goes indigo, violet. So it's a bluey purple color, and um, wealthy people tended to like indigo, tended to use. That, that's a really interesting thing. So, so my friend said, Miss Richardson, every time I see indigo, basically, that looks like there's rice with it. There's indigo and rice in Georgia, indigo and rice in North Carolina. Um, South Carolina just has rice, and Virginia just has tobacco, and Maryland looks like they have tobacco also. What, why do you think indigo and rice would have been grown together? What, what would your guess be? If you were a guessing person, what would your guess be? No, I want you to think about, well, what crops do we grow in Michigan around us? You might see what? Corn. What else might you see? Grain. What else might you see? Beans. Oh, we have a lot of beans. We have navy beans, cranberry beans, soybeans, pinto beans. Um, I know when I was a kid, I think we were the Navy bean capital of the world or something when I was a kid, or Gratiot County or something was the Navy bean capital of either the world or Michigan, something like that. Um, they are, but... But if they're grown together, they t they need the similar cool, similar cool, cool eye climate. They need a similar climate. So notice down the further south, we've got Georgia, which does rice and indigo. South Carolina's just rice. North Carolina's rice and indigo. And those three states would have similar climate. When you get further north, look, North Carolina has um, tobacco, Virginia has tobacco, and it looks like Maryland has tobacco. Now, as you go further north, yeah, it's Pennsylvania. Does Pennsylvania do tobacco? No, they grow green. So Pennsylvania, and we call this, um, they were the bread basket, right? because they grew so much grain. So Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York are grain. And then you get up to the East Coast. The East Coast has Massachusetts. Um, I think this is Delaware. New Hampshire, Maine, and... Uh, so this is Rhode Island, Massachusetts. Oh, that's Connecticut. I knew I would come up with it eventually. Connecticut... New Hampshire, Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, and then Maine. So Maine has, Maine is known for their lobsters, which is not on here, but their wood products. 
New Hampshire has fish. Massachusetts looks like they also have fish. And then they're shipbuilders. They build ships because they're on the East Coast. Um, I don't think I've seen anything in Maryland. Maryland's got the tobacco leaf, right? No, Virginia's here. This is Maryland here. Okay. Well, I mean, but some some states that but this is okay. This is exports. Okay, what does export mean? Yeah, so exports are the things that we send out of our country. So this means to export something, we have enough of this, we don't need this, so we're going to send it to you, and then in return we get money or something. So, um, it's kind of like when I buy a yarn advent, right? Now, mind you, export means they leave the country, but um, I could buy a yarn advent from another country, true story. I could buy it from Canada or I could buy it from Paris, France or I saw one from England. But I choose not to buy them from that far away because the, Eng the ones that would come from England are going to be costing me $25 to $30 for shipping. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. So I don't really want to buy a yarn advent from England and add 25 to $30 to the already expensive price that I have to pay. Um, but that would be something that would be an export. Um, and so it says, in the early 1700s, almost every colonist farmed the land. Most families have small farms, but a few had plantations. We've talked a lot about plantations in last week or last week or last couple of weeks. Although colonists made a living from farming, each region grew different, uh, different crops. Look at the map, which we did, to find the major crops and goods each region exported. What goods were exported from each of the New England, Middle, and Southern colonies? So the Southern colonies is indigo, tobacco, and rice. The Middle colonies exported grain. The New England colonies exported fish and wood products and ships okay that's the stuff that they're exporting and then we need to think about what are they importing so if we're exporting those goods what goods do we need here that we can't get where we live so it's kind of like when i ordered remember i ordered those um wooden scotty dog buttons from england I imported them. I couldn't find any in the United States that were just as cute. So I imported them from England. So would we probably get, like, shipped from the New England colonies exports? Now, so those exports, and if we go back to the, if we go to the next page. So remember, here's our triangle trade route. And we looked at this the other day. So they leave from New York. Now, mind you, they would have taken, I uh, wouldn't have gone to the Triangle Trade Route. Um, part of it might have, but they would have left this area and they would have probably gone to England in this case, not necessarily um, here, but they would have left they would leave uh, New York or Boston and they would take their goods from the, so, so the goods from here, the goods from uh, the New England colonies, the middle colonies and the southern colonies would leave. So the middle, co the New England colonies would probably leave from Boston or New York. The middle colonies would leave from here. Southern colonies would leave from here. And they're going to take their goods back to England. Why would they take it to England? Who colonized the United States? Whose colonies were we a part of? Right 
you're right. They would have taken it from the United, or they would have taken it from the colonies and taken it back to England, and England could sell it for more. But where, whose colonies were we? We're England's colonies. That's why we speak English. English. So, because remember, when we when we were back here, when we're back here, right, um, you had pilgrims and Plymouth and Puritans were growing in numbers in England. Puritans were a group of English Protestants that we were English. They came over, and then we talked about where they settled, right? New England. That's why it's England, not New Amsterdam. It's New England. Then we read, we also read about the middle colonies. Now, the middle colonies, the Dutch, founded New Netherlands, and um, but they renamed that later to the English renamed the New Netherlands New. New York. The English renamed the New Netherland New York in honor of King Charles' brother, the Duke of York. They're English. It's not like a king, but a different word, but it's somebody with a title. I'd have to look up the hierarchy. There, there are titles, but I'm not sure what the what the, how the titles translate. All right, so then it says many Catholics were treated badly as well. So Pilgrims, Puritans, and Quakers were not the only group that could not practice their religions freely in England. So because they couldn't practice their fr religions freely in England, they came to the colonies so they could practice their religions freely in the colonies. We are English colonies. Um uh, I'm ba I'm back on two thirty. I went back so I could show you. Um Some of the colonies were started by England. Some of the colonies the English took over. That's why when we were fighting the Revolutionary War, who were we fighting? England. So Sarah Bishop, her family was for the king, the king of England. Sophia and Sophia's War, her family was pro the revolution or and they were against the Eng England and England's colonies Brit Britain British is also England English Great Britain is another name Great Britain covers um I want I want to say like England is like the country England and then, um, but they are also rulers of, and I don't want to get this wrong, at one point Scotland wanted to break away, but I don't know. So Great Britain is like England, Scotland, Wales, and there might be a fourth one. They're kind of like, so it's kind of like the United States has states. The United States has like Michigan, Florida, Georgia. Georgia. So we have states that are united, and England or Great Britain has co like countries that are kind of united. Yeah, so this book encompasses a lot more than what we get to cover, unfortunately, in a year. Yep. The big picture. 
As more people arrived in the English colonies, their economy grew. Some of the products the colonies produced appeared in the infograph on page 232. During this time, England tried to control trade with its colonies. England's rulers said that some products from the colonies could only be exported to England. To export means to send goods to other countries for sale or trade. Now, I don't know about you, but do you like being told who you can sell your stuff to? No. no. In exchange for colonies products, the colonists imported cloth, metal, tools, 228. In exchange for colonies products, the colonists imported cloth, metal, tools, glass, and machines. To import means to bring goods from another country for sale or use. The English paid low prices for the colony's goods, which they later sold to other Europeans at much higher prices. So if my friend's farm sold, raised a bunch of grain and they sold it to England, England might pay them a dollar for the grain that they bought. But... In return, they sold it to all the other countries around them for a dollar a bag instead of a dollar for the whole thing. So England earned a ton of money off of it. Um, so England paid low prices for the colony's goods, but they later sold to the other Europeans at much higher prices. Yet England did not have to have complete control over the colonial trade. Some colonies were able to trade with other colonies to make a profit. Everybody wants a profit. Profit means you earn more than you spend. That is a profit. Okay? So there's a picture. This is an oil painting of a colonial farm. It was probably done about 1732. The indigo plant at the right, so this is indigo, came from probably came from South Carolina. So that's indigo. So, if I made one of the Easter eggs that I've been hiding, right? If I made one of the Easter eggs, and I, so if I bought yarn from England to make the Easter egg, and I finished the Easter egg, and I sold it back to England, I might buy the yarn for $30 for a whole skein. And maybe England will only buy the finished product back from me for a um, dollar or something. And so I can sell one, one egg to England for a dollar, but they charge me $30 for the yarn. Am I going to make enough money, do you think? Maybe if, you make, maybe if you would make... If I can make 30 eggs with one skein... But what if I can't? Then you're out of luck. I'm kind of out of luck. So here's a skein of yarn. Or a hank. I call it hank. Usually the ones that I get, the ones that we bought, I bought from the downtown dime. That's usually called a skein. This is usually called a hank. Okay. Let's say this hank of yarn, now it, this is actually dyed. Um, you can see a little bit of the variance in it, but not a lot. Um, but let's say it was dyed like the colorful Easter eggs are, right? So here's my Easter egg. So there's my little egg. Let's say this cost me $30. It can. It depend on what kind of yarn If I buy commercial yarn, it can be cheaper. So if it's commercially dyed, the stuff that I buy that I bought for your ornaments are um, a lot pricier. Um, so yeah, sometimes some some dyers sell this. Um, hand dyed thing for um, $32, 26, 26 generally is pretty cheap, um, 
Yeah. So, and when you figure, uh, uh, the remember the shawl I made for one of my friends, the orangey colored one? Oh, yeah. That one was two of these. Did you make it finished? Oh, yeah. That one was two of these. So, two of these it would be like, you know, in our story, 60 bucks, right? Was that really super big? No, 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 no. Was the shawl that I made from two of these really big? No. no. So, so just to give you an idea of perspective, and this is really skinny yarn, and so there's a lot more. There's a lot more. What's called yardage. So there's a lot. It's a lot more yarn because it's skinnier, right? <clears throat> now. Let's say for our example, now I have no idea how much yarn I used on this little wee bitty egg, okay? But let's say for my example, I was, if, if, this, if this was 10 grams and this is 100 grams, right? I can make 10 eggs from one of these. If this cost me $30 and I can only make 10 of these, I would have to be able to sell each of my egg for three bucks. Four dollars if I want to make a profit, or more, at least more than three if I want to make a profit. So here's what we've got. So what would happen is maybe we sell our wool to England. Okay? So we sell our wool to England, and England says, I will give you one dollar for 100 grams of wool, okay? So the same amount, the wool that would make this, we sell to England for a dollar. England charges us 30 bucks to get this back. Now granted, somebody had to dye it to get it back, but that's what was happening. England got to decide how much they were gonna pay us for the thing that they were buying from us and they got to decide how much they were gonna sell it back to us for. The change happens when um, the change happens when there's a bunch of people that want this same product, right? If I have this yarn and I can sell it, or if I have this Easter egg, let's use the egg. If I have this Easter egg and I have, raise your hand if you would like to buy this Easter egg. Let's just pretend. Raise your hand if you like this egg and you're like, oh, Miss Richardson, I'd like to buy this egg. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. If I have eighteen people that would love this egg, Miss Richardson, I love that egg. That's a pretty color. I want it for myself. Okay. If I have one front. If I have one friend, there's only one friend I can sell it to. The one friend can say, eh, I'm only going to pay a dollar for it. And you can't sell it to anybody else. If I can only sell it to one person and that one person says, I'm going to pay you one dollar, Miss Richardson, and you can't sell it to anybody else, what am I going to do? I'm probably going to sell it for my one dollar. I get my one dollar for my one Easter egg. Or I don't sell it, but if I don't sell it, do I earn any money? So I can't crochet anymore if I can't buy more yarn. If I don't have money, I can't crochet anymore. Is that going to be a happy Miss Richardson? Probably not. Mm-hmm. Right. So what happens is England says you're our colonies. We're going to buy your products and we're going to tell you how much we're going to buy them for. What happens is, is we have France in there. Then there's two people that want to buy my egg. Do you think I can get them more money if two people want to buy my egg? Yeah. What if I auctioned off my one egg and there's 17 people that like it? Do you think I can get even more money for my one egg? I could get a lot of money if they desperately want it. So the, the thing with the economy is your product is only as good as the people that want to buy it. 
What happened when we, what happened when, um, oh, shoot, I just thought, what's, what country's at war with Russia right now? Ukraine. 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 Thank you. I just totally mind blinked. So when Russia invades Ukraine, what happens? The United States says, no thanks, we're not buying gas from Russia right now. Right? So then, oh, well, if we're not buying Russia's gas we have to buy gas from somewhere else well okay so then not just the united states decides that there's a lot of other countries that decided that too no thanks russia you can keep your gas we will find somebody else we want to buy gas from all of a sudden the egg is like the gas right Gas price is going to go through the roof. I have 17 people wanting to buy my little egg or my little bit of gas. And so I can say, ah, oh, that's fine. I have no problem with you buying my egg for $200. And there's probably somebody that's willing to pay 200 bucks for my little egg. Now, is my egg worth 200 bucks? No. But, but. That that's what happens with artists, right? Artists will say, oh, here's my painting or here's my whatever. Well, people start to really like that artist and they might decide, oh, we'll pay you a lot of money to make something for us, Miss Richardson, right? Or, you know, Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh or Da Vinci or whatever. And the, some of their stuff is worth a lot of money today. Right. So, um, if you make a poor choice, you could be locked in to that price for a long time. So, if you are a first-time artist and you're signing with a record label, you either A, want to make sure you keep the contract short, or B, try to get as far away, you know, as, as much bang for your buck as you can get. Because if you become a really popular author or rapist or whatever, you could potentially earn millions of dollars, right? But if your deal is poor, then you're kind of out of, up a crick. All right, so let's go back to what we got. Guy, like, started buying him, like, and art stuff, and he yeah, so a lot of times we decide how much something is worth. We set the value. Um, and we set it based off of what we're willing to pay. If I'm a super gamer and the newest what? What, si what system would I want to game on? Okay, the, let's say PS6 comes out, and I love gaming. Am I, and, and what's the PS5 cost? Okay, so, so let's say the PS5 is $500. I love gaming. The PS6 is coming out. I find the PS6 is coming out. Do I want, so I'm like, ooh. So then you have to figure out what are you willing to pay for it, right? Are you willing to pay the $500 or probably $600 for the PS6? Now, if it's a, if it's a th shh, if it's a thousand dollars, is the thousand dollars worth it to you? It might be. If, but but maybe the best football helmet would be worth it to you. Maybe the best, I don't know, is worth it to you. Um, okay. And so, you know, my, my mom bought a phone recently, and I bought a phone recently. 
My phone is way, way more expensive than my mom's phone. Way, way more expensive than my mom's phone. Because my mom got a version of a droid, right? And I did not. I got an Apple phone. Now, here's the scoop. They both have three cameras. They both can probably do about the same thing, but I really like my Apple product, right? And, and I think, so Apple says, okay, this is the cost of this product. And Apple does put out like a cheaper version of stuff. Um, as in they have like the SE, they have an SE2 or an SE3 out now, um, which is a, a less expensive product. Um, and, and so, but Apple gets to decide. There's enough people that want the Apple product that Apple gets to decide how much money they're going to charge you, right? If enough people said, nope, so sorry, Apple, we're not buying that, then Apple would eventually do what? They would probably have to drop their price. Now, is there enough people that are going to say, no, thanks, Bob, we're not going to get the new phone? No, because they want what they want, they like what they got, and they're going to stick with it. And I'm just as guilty. I think the reason people aren't very smart, quote unquote, is because, you know, oh, I really want the third camera, or I really want the newest, latest, greatest, brightest bulb in the pack, right? And I think because we're a consumeristic society, consumer means we're driven by what we buy, um, we're not willing to wait for something. I'm just as guilty of it, right? I order, I ordered new crochet hooks. They totally suckered me in. I bought the same size crochet hooks as I already have. Same exact size. Do you know what they did? They changed the color on the bottom. And I'm like, oh, I love that color. Look around the room. What color do you think the new crochet hook is going to be? Look. It is. It's a mint color. It's a mint. It is like the color of my crates. I fell in love and I'm like oh do I need another hook that's that fits this yarn not really but I bought it why did I buy it it's so stinking pretty it's so stinking pretty because it's the color I love totally totally suckered me in they put out the lime one you're laughing but you know exactly what I'm talking about don't you they put out a lime one a couple years ago, and then I'm like, oh, which hook do I need in this lime color? They had a lavender one, and I like the lavender, but it is just not. But they put that mint one out, and I'm like, okay, Mr. Richardson, you don't need a mint hook. You don't need a mint hook. And guess who ordered it? Me. <laughs> oh no, I accidentally bought it. Now, did I, but, but here's the thing. That's part of what's called consumerism, right? They make this really cute shirt and you see somebody wearing this really cute shirt and you're like, oh my gosh, I gotta have this really cute shirt. Yep. My somebody I love, let's put it that way. My somebody I love recently bought a shirt, an a shirt from um, I don't know it might have been eBay but or, or Etsy but they recently bought a shirt and it's because it's a pop group they like a, like a music group a pop well it's not hip hop but it's I don't know anyways not a lolly I don't know but I really don't know but they spent a lot of money on the sweatshirt I go to Mackinac Island. Mackinac Island's like, sorry, Miss Richardson, this sweatshirt's 50 bucks. I'm like, well, guess what? I got 50 bucks for my sweatshirt. But it depends on what you want and what you're willing to spend. Now, when I buy clothing, clothing's very expensive for me because of, 
because of my size. There's certain places I can buy clothes that are in my size. So they get me over a pickle barrel because I need clothes that fit me. You guys can go to pretty much any place and buy clothes that'll fit you, right? I can't do that. I have to go to certain stores that'll fit me. Well, yeah, baby store, I guess, wouldn't fit you. All right, so let's go back to this. It says, early the, in the early 1700s, agriculture, or the business of farming, was the major way of life in the English colonies. About 9 out of 10 colonists made a living from agriculture. So if we counted off in our classroom, if we counted to 9 and the 10th person sat down, there are going to be three people in this classroom that do not make a living with agriculture, and everybody else did. That means planting, farming, growing, harvesting. Nine out of ten people in here would. Um, some farms were so successful that they had a surplus or they had extra crops to sell. By selling crops and other products, colonists were following a system of free enterprise. In a free enterprise system, people can start any business they want. They decide what to make and how much to produce and what price to charge. I'm buying yarn from somebody and I said to them, they sold me some alpaca last summer and I figured it out, I need three more, at least three more, I'll probably buy four more. So I messaged her on Etsy and I said, pretty please with sugar on top, please keep me in mind because I need at least three more hanks, 100 gram hanks of yarn to finish off the project I want to make, okay? Now, she's kind of got me over a pickle barrel, right? She could say, well, so sorry, those three, those three hanks are gonna cost you whatever because I wanna get them from her. Do I think she's gonna do that? No, but she could. I haven't, she hasn't, she, the, the alpaca's wool is at the mill right now so it's being turned from wool into yarn magic um yes uh-huh they have pot they don't kill the dog well but think about but think about but think about it though they either brush it, right, or they might, you you take your dog to the groomer in the summertime, and a lot of times, if you're not Jasper and Nathaniel, you get your big, thick fur buzzed off, right? Yeah, that's what happens at college. No, he's got really skinny fur, so we put little coats on him when he goes outside in the freezing cold. All right. So it says, um, as you have read, each region of the colonies had different natural resources. Now you will read how these resources helped each region to develop its own special economy. The southern colonies, the hot, humid climate and good soil of the southern colonies were well suited for growing crops. Farmers and planters used much of their land for cash crops. Cash crops means you make money from your crop, okay? They grew and exported tobacco, rice, and indigo to England. In 1774, Elizabeth Lucas Pickney succeeded in growing indigo on three farms she managed in South Carolina. English merchants needed the blue dye from the indigo plant for their huge cloth making businesses. Indigo quickly became a major cash crop of the southern colonies. So that's the south, right, where there's slaves. In the middle colonies, as you have read, farmers in the middle colonies grew so much wheat and corn that people called their region the breadbasket of the colonies. These farmers looked south to the English colonies in the West Indies for a place to sell their surplus grain. The colonists of the West Indies needed to import grain to feed the people they held in slavery. So the West Indies get slaves, right? And then they have to feed the slaves. Little of their land was available to grow food because the colonial planters 
in the West Indies used most of it to plant cash crops such as sugar cane. On such islands as Jamaica, Mon, and Barbados, Jamaica and Barbados, Jamaica, Mon, and Barbados, colonists ran huge farms with hundreds of enslaved worker, African workers. Yep. I didn't see the horses fighting, but... Okay, so it says New England harbors in the 1700s, so this is the 1700s, New England harbor, were busy fishing centers. Today, they attract many tourists below. So this is still a harbor. It's just not as busy, but it does still have fishing industry. New Englanders and the sea. In the rocky soil of New England, farmers barely grew enough crops to feed themselves. As a result, many New Englanders turned to the thick forest or the sea to make a living. In the 1700s, waters off the coast of Massachusetts were among the richest fishing areas in the world. Some New Englanders became fishers. Others became builders of ships. Well, that makes sense. If you've got a bunch of fish outside your back door, you're going to become fishermen, right? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Profits from the sea. To create a fishing fleet, New, Englander, New England needed ships. English ships were too expensive for the colonists to buy. So you, can you imagine buying a ship in England and then having to send a bunch of people over to, to bring it back to England, New England? That would take a lot. It would be very expensive. So the workers began cutting down trees from New England's large forest to build their own ships. By 1741, New England had a fleet, a fleet is multiple ships, of more than 800 fishing boats. New England ships were built so well that soon the English companies were buying them. New Englanders sold their fish to Spain, Portugal, and the West Indies. New England's fishing and whaling industries made large profits. An industry is all the businesses that make one kind of product or provide one kind of service. So an industry provides one service. So like when I go to the cobbler shop in Elma, what's their one service? Cobbler means no shoes. Cobbler shop is a shoe shop in Elma. That's all right. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Nope, there is cobbler, like yum, I just had peach cobbler, which is a food. Cobbler shop, a, the job of a cobbler used to be to make, a sh make shoes. So when you had the job of a cobbler, you made shoes to, so my friend, Miss, my friend would come in and say, hey, I need shoes that fit my feet. So a cobbler's job like, you know, the elves and the shoemaker? Yeah. So the job of the, the cobbler was they were a shoemaker. You would come in, I need a shoes in this size or whatever, and the, the cobbler would make shoes that fit your feet. Cobbler. Um, uh, it would take time, right? Because they would have to cut, like, you know, the, the, like the elves and the shoemaker. He had to cut the leather. He had to cut the bottom part. He had to sew them together, right? 
Yep, you would go in and order it and you had to wait a certain amount of time and shoes were super expensive, right? Yeah. Um, so fishing and shipbuilding helped create other industries in New England. Ships needed ropes, sails, and other equipment. These were also made in New England. Before long, Boston, the largest city in New England, became a busy trading center. Merchants and tradespeople from all over New England and the Middle Colonies came to sell their products. Now, this is a big deal. Um, I'm going to go a little bit into my time I'm not supposed to be taking. It's a big deal. The triangular trade. Many New England merchants and sea captains also became rich in the triangular trade. We talked about this a little bit ago, uh, a few days ago. The map on page 231, we're going to talk about it again in a minute, shows how the colonial trade routes formed a triangle. The first leg of the triangle starts at such ports as Boston and New York. Traders sailed from these ports to the coast of West Africa, where they traded rum. Rum was made from sugar cane. Sugar cane is sugar, right? Process. Sugar before it became, yep. And then, and guns for gold. There's gold in Africa, ivory, ivory is the tusks of a rhinoceros or an elephant, and they were um, pretty valuable, and captive Africans, so slaves. The second leg of the triangle began in Africa. This part of the voyage was called the Middle Passage because it was the middle part of the triangular trade route. Thousands of Africans died on the voyage to the Americas, which lasted six to eight weeks. Thousands died. Thousands. Now let's talk about this. Thousands. Do we even have a thousand people in this building? So you figure in third grade, you th figure in third grade, there's about 20 kids per Class in third grade, there's 40 classes. That's about 80 people. In fourth grade, there's three classes, um, and there's about 20 or something in each one. So that's about another, like, let's say it's 75 people. In fifth grade, there's about 30 kids in each room. That's about 90 people. So, so far, we have 80 plus 75 plus 90. A three, less than 300, right? You add up the sixth grades, the sixth grades have about 30 people per grade, three classes. That's another. So we have maximum, we probably have maximum amount of people in this building is 400. Even with the staff, I mean, at the very mat, like, there's not, there's no way there's 100 staff people here. No way. So, so if you, even if you round it up, even if you round it up to 500. Now think about no think about south. They combine those you probably You might get close. But probably it would take all three buildings to get up to 1000. That's 1000. 1000. Look at this. Thousands of Africans died on the voyage to the Americas, which lasted six to eight weeks. Thousands of people died on a trip that lasted six to eight weeks. There's more. There's more than 1,000. There's more than 2,000. Thousands. Plural. In the West Indies, the sea captains traded Africans for molasses, a thick syrup made from sugar cane. I remember we talked about molasses cookies, right? Then they returned to New England where the molasses was made into rum, which is alcohol. This was the last leg in the triangular trade route. Port cities such as Boston grew very quickly on the money they earned in the triangular trade. And we already looked at this picture of how closely they were smushed into the ship. Yeah, it's pretty pretty gruesome. So look at this. They started out in Boston or New York. It looks like most of it was New York. And they took rum that they made from the molasses, iron, 
goods and guns and they took it to Africa. When they got to Africa, they picked up enslaved Africans where they took them to the West Indies and then they picked up the molasses. Now we also learned that they also carried what? They said they carried grain. It doesn't say they carried grain on here, but they would have carried grain, right? Because they needed to take grain to the West Indies because the West Indies just did raise sugar cane with hundreds of slaves and they didn't make, they didn't raise grain there. So they, and they had to feed them. So they would have taken grain with their rum, iron goods, and guns, and then took, dropped the rum, iron goods, and guns off in Africa, picked up the slaves, taken them to West Indies, dropped off the grain, picked up the molasses, probably left some of the slaves, and then took the rest of them back. Upper Peninsula. Oh my. Well, that's like fun. That's very cool. Yeah, that's a good point. So my friend said behind this corner would be a lot more people. And I think I think the thing of it is is that this knowing this and understanding this little bit is a big deal in social studies. It is a really big deal, which is why I took time to go over it one more time. Because it really would not shock me if this was part of your M step next week or possibly stuff you see on the NWEA. Oh, we don't do NWEA for social studies. But um, my guess is that would not surprise me if it was on the M step. Now, am I saying that it's going to be on the M step? No, because I don't really know what's going to be on the M step. But I know that this is a really big deal. It is a really big deal that we bought and sold people. It's a really big deal that we traded them for the goods and services. This is a big deal. Um, and this is, a big, this is a big concept to understand when we're part of the colonies. And whose colonies were we? We were England's colonies, which is why we speak English. You know, and, and, and um, I watch a podcast that happens in Canada. There's a, a province in Canada that's bilingual. They have French and English things on their sign. They're bilingual. They have two languages. And um, we could have been French too. It, because Fran, we have, France had forts in Michigan. And so we could have essentially been, uh, I think it's parlez-vous français? I think it's like, do you speak French? I, I want to say that's what it is. And and so, you know, it it's a big deal that we are an English colony. Um, speaking of French, why are Scottish called French? Though? I have no idea. That is beyond my purview. All right. Uh, we'll talk to you later.